Welcome to Occult of Personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire at occultofpersonality.net. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky, and your co-host is Rudolf Berger. Occult of Personality podcast is available on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher Radio, Acast, TuneIn, and all the best podcast apps. This is episode number 182, featuring an interview with Josephine McCarthy and Michael Shepard of Korea, a new school of magic for the 21st century. A Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to the Chamber of Reflection at chamberofreflection.com, the newly redesigned A Cult of Personality membership section as well as all of our patrons who participate via the Occult of Personality Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash occult of personality. I also want to take a moment to mention Rudolph, our co-host, and his brand new podcast, Thoth Hermes, available at thothhermes.com. It's also on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher Radio, and other podcasts podcast platforms is an excellent new podcast with interviews of magical practitioners and researchers Um, it's had about five episodes to date and they've all been rather excellent as I'm sure you're aware from his fine interviewing skills here um, Rudolph is a world-class interviewer and podcaster so again i encourage you to check out his show thoth hermes at thothhermes.com a cult of personality podcast is also sponsored by miskatonic books an online store that focuses on the esoteric occult ceremonial magic freemasonry rosicrucianism witchcraft the golden dawn as well as dark fantasy, classic horror, and supernatural fiction. They carry books by all your favorite esoteric publishers as well. Just visit MiskatonicBooks.com Temple of Thelema is a true outer order of the greater mysteries, providing ceremonial initiation, structure training, and regular group work, all in conformity with the principles of the Book of the Law. An investment of time, effort, and commitment is expected from each member. Each is expected to aspire fervently to the great work, to dare, with courage undaunted, to perfect that work, and ever to apply his or her best effort to effect harmony within the order and within the world in general. Founded in service to the AA, College of Thelema seeks to guide the student to an understanding of the law of Thelema. Most especially, this means a deeper understanding of oneself and of one's true will. A combination of instruction techniques is employed, including seminars, written texts, and individual work. For over 40 years, College of Thelema has published journals in the Continuum and Black Pearl, as well as several books on occult subjects maintaining high standards in Thelemic education. Visit Temple of Thelema at www.thelema.org. Anathema Publishing Limited. Quality occult books and contemporary esoterica. Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a trenosophic relationship in troth and gabo between publisher, author, and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism, 
traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian theosophy. Visit Anathema Publishing at www.anathemapublishing.com as well as their online store at www.freewebstore.org slash anathema publishing. Now, in episode number 182, Josephine McCarthy and Michael Shepard join us to speak about Korea, a new school of magic for the 21st century at www.quarea.com. That's Q U A R E I A. Josephine, Michael, Rudolph, and I have a great conversation about magic, mystery schools, and mostly Quarea, a wonderful new online magic course that is offered for free and is undoubtedly a strong contender for the best course material available. It's described on their website as follows. Korea, the new school of magic for the 21st century, is a concept that was born out of conversations between adepts Josephine McCarthy and Frater Acher, two European magicians with solid magical reputations. The course is spread over three sections, apprentice, initiate, and adept. Each section has 10 modules, and each module has 8 lessons. Each of the three sections is approximately 500,000 words. It is the most extensive, in-depth, and intelligent, up-to-date magical course that is currently available worldwide. There are no teachers. The course is designed specifically for loan, exploration, experience, and study. The success of the Korea student comes from hard work, personal application, inner contact, and the necessary study and work. Korea teaches the skills that underpin many different forms of magic. If you've heard Josephine in either of her two prior interviews here, or read any of her work, you are already aware of how special she is. The depth and quality of the work that has gone into the creation of Korea is astounding, and if I had to recommend a single resource for learning the art of magic, it would undoubtedly be Korea. That is a heavy endorsement, but one I feel comfortable about after having worked with more than a few schools and systems in order to be able to compare. Um, I think Korea provides potential students with an excellent source of knowledge to begin and sustain their magical training, and I would highly recommend it. Josephine and Michael, I want to welcome you both to a Cult of Personality podcast. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And thank you for asking us. It's really yes. good to talk to you again. And it's nice yes. to talk to you for the first time. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to meet you, Michael, and absolutely a pleasure to speak with you again, Josephine. For people who may not already be familiar with you and your work, perhaps you could just give us a little bit of a brief bio and background for each of you. I'm a, an occultist, a magician. I'm based in the UK now. I worked a lot in the States for 11 years, actually longer. I used to commute back and forth from Europe. And I started writing books in 2009, once I'd got my kids out the door and wasn't teaching groups anymore. It seemed to make more sense to write. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And the last three years, I've been writing Quarrier, which is a, an online free magical training course for people. And apart from that, I live on Dartmoor in the middle of nowhere with my husband and piles of cats and books. And that's it. I'm just a boring grandma. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not so sure about boring. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I wouldn't agree either. <laughs> so I'm Michael Shepherd. As occultists go, I'm definitely still in my larval stage compared to uh, being particularly uh, widely experienced. I've been going perhaps about seven years on this sort of path, dumbled into it when I suddenly developed this compulsion to buy a tarot pack in Germany when I was working in Germany and started just drawing one card a day 
and having that card represent the day. And I do that in the morning. And after about three weeks of this, I was sufficiently sort of shaken in my materialism and, and skepticism about whether or not tarot was going to work because it was bang on. The cards were always <laughs> completely right for the day, which made me think, well, this shouldn't really work, should it? <laughs> so I started reading a bit of Crowley, started reading a bit of Golden Dawn stuff, trying things out, got as far as I could with that, and then ran into Josephine's work in 2013, I suppose, and got in touch with her at the point that she put a draft of a Magician's Health Survival Guide um, up on her blog, and asked if she wanted a, an editor. And she said, no, we have, I've got an editor, but you can pretend to be my editor and I will, um, I'll pretend to be your sort of author and we'll go back and forth and you get some experience that way. And that's how we met. And then a year later or so, I offered to edit the Quarrier course. And that's my story so far. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I remember that Magical Health series. That was quite something. Also raised my attention as well. The way you pronounce Korea, for me, not being an English native speaker is so fascinating. Can you say it again to me? <laughs> Korea? <laughs> yeah, perfect. And well, Korea just... is a bit the occasion why we are all meeting today here. Yeah. Josephine, could you let us know what gave you the idea of creating Korea? And can you a bit explain maybe what, what it is exactly? Um, well, it started with conversations with Freta Acher. We've been good friends for a long time and we were talking back and forth and he'd come and visit me in England. I'd go visit him in Germany. And one of the things we kept coming back to was bemoaning the state of magical training, not to put down the schools that are out there, but just that, you know, they, a lot of them were formed in the 19th century and a lot in early to mid 20th century. And, and we're evolving and moving so quickly things were getting left behind and we were noticing that with people who were approaching both of us with questions and so we talked back and forth and he kept saying to me in his nice German accent you know Josephine you you really need to write a magical course and I'm like no I really don't need to write a magical course that's that's not on my radar at all because that's a lot of work and he sort of maneuvered me into it more and more bit by bit so I went out to Germany and we sat and we had a very long conversation about it. And it, it sort of evolved through a series of conversations with other magicians who were friends of Acha in, in Germany as to what was actually needed, what was missing for now in the era that we're in. And then so I started talking with more and more magicians. I started talking with teachers and with, you know, people who were heading lodges and then also beginners and, and just listening to people. And from that, I, what I decided to do originally was write a book that would give someone enough information for them to then choose a magical training that's already out there, which would be the most appropriate one for them, and to give them some basics so they had a basic vocabulary and a basic understanding of things. And that was all I was going to do, was write a book. And whenever you set an intention, of course, you get kicked off that intention and something else comes in. And it sort of started growing. What I do is, because I'm sort of pre-tech age person, is I, I got huge sheets of paper out and started mapping where do people need to actually get to in magical training? If they want to be a true adept, what do they need? So that was the top of the pyramid. This, this is where people need to get in all facets of magic. And then started working back down. Okay, well, what do they need to achieve that? That's one layer. Then underneath that, what do they need to achieve to get to that step? And, and building it and building it and building it. Until I realized what I was doing was taking magic apart in the same way that I used to teach ballet. You know, I, I had Russian trainers and the Vaganova method is, is about absolute detail from the foundation up in a very particular way that gives purity of technique while also allowing development of the artist. So I started applying, taking it apart technically and tearing all the pieces up and looking at them, how they interrelate with each other and, and what was missing 
say, in a specific training group that's already available, what's missing? Why are those foundations missing? What part of that? All it takes is is a small part of technique to make the whole thing collapse. You don't just build a, a physical pyramid by stacking things on top of each other. It has to have pressure um, structures within the middle of the pyramid to ease the pressure. And if you look at the development in architecture, in Egypt, for example, where they were experimenting with pyramids, all of the first ones collapse because they just put one on top of the other and it doesn't work like that. There's a lot of hidden things that go into building a pyramid and it's the same magical training. There's a lot of hidden things that need to be in there for the structure to actually be secure uh, and to last. So it started growing and growing and growing and growing. And I was like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. Uh, And it was at that point when I met Michael and he'd done formal training in editing and wanted practice. So I, I did in the magical healing stuff to work on because it already had all the editing notes and from the editor so he could see how it were working. Every writer needs an editor and you need a good editor. You know, lots of people do contact to say, oh, I want to be your translator or I want to be your editor. And they don't actually have a clue mm-hmm. how much work is involved and what it's actually about. But I began to realise very quickly that he actually knew what he was doing and he was very good at it. So I said to him, right, well, do you want a project? (laughs) (laughs) It it might be a bit on the big side. At this point, Acha had stepped in. He'd been very much sort of the bully pushing me along the path to do it, giving me a lot of very good advice on structure and, and how to approach things, and also took over designing the website doing all of that side of it he paid for the website Um, he put everything into making sure that it would actually go up so I started breaking everything down into lessons Michael started editing them Acha would do the layout and design and up they would go just after that it just took on a life of its own once the structure skeleton and and sort of plan was there Putting the plan together alone took about three months because there's so much involved in it and breaking it all down into the pieces as to what needed to go where. And it's just trotted along. It's just taken on a life of its own and finally finished on the solstice in December. We hope it's going to have a long and good life. (laughs) Well, the thing is, it will will live as long as it needs to live um, until something better comes along. Because that's the other thing is when people put magical courses together, you know, even in the 19th century, there was an attitude of this is the whole truth. This is it. and This will last forever. And it doesn't work like that. Each generation we change, we evolve, we devolve as well in, in other aspects. And so you need training to reflect that change. So each generation, there should be somebody who comes out and I just happen to be right place, right time, right people for it to happen. I don't expect it to live forever. I expect it to live as long as it needs to until it becomes obsolete and somebody else comes along and goes, you know, this is a pile of crap. This just doesn't work for us anymore. <laughs> and and just something better. Yeah. Michael, I'm curious if you could say a few words about your reactions to the task that you were presented with for someone so new to this area of study. I mean, but to, <laughs> for this type of task, it, it would seem daunting to anyone, I would think. Well, the, the wonderful thing when you don't know something is you don't know you don't know it. I was fairly sort of blithely going on my merry way, checking the spelling, you know. Actually, if you look at some of the first things I sent back to Josephine, they came back with notes saying... Michael, you've changed this word and completely changed the meaning of what I was saying. I was like, have I? How? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) And and now, of course, because I speak Josephine, I can see, looking back on it, (laughs) that's what I was doing. But at the time, I thought I was just trying to copy edit, make the thing pretty. (laughs) And uh, yeah, so it, it didn't really daunt me as much as it probably would have done if I'd known going into it what I know coming out the other side. There's 15 paperbacks sitting on my bookshelf. And I have to say, I don't really know how they got there. We were chatting about this earlier this morning. We were saying, actually, it's actually quite hard to think back and remember each stage of the process. Because once we were in it, she was writing, I was editing, and it it was just all kind of rolling around like a machine. And then we kind of got spat out the other side of it. And there were these 13 modules of training 
which look like uh, 15 big books, if you see them on the bookshelf, or a lot of PDFs online. So looking back on it, I was climbing the Matterhorn blindfolded, which uh, sounds pretty suicidal, but thankfully Josephine was at uh, the other end of the rope. And then I sort of look back on it and go, bloody hell, how did, we, how did we do that? I didn't react as much as I probably would have done if I'd known what I was letting myself in for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the lamb to the slaughter. Come, little. Yeah, that's right. The sacrificial <laughs> lamb. Thankfully, yeah. that wasn't like the climax of the course was sacrificing the editor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, for our listeners who have not yet looked at it, it's three degrees, which means 30 modules, 240 lessons. So it's about 3,500 pages, I think. I counted it one day just to get the overview of it. So the Matterhorn <laughs> is quite enormous that you climbed there. Yeah? And we didn't uh, intend originally to do the books. It was just going to be online and free. Which it still is. Yes. And that was my big thing. There's a big debate in magic, particularly in America, that people should pay. Uh, and that's all well and good if you live in America and you have a job. If you live in Africa, if you live in China or some of these countries where the income is much, much, much lower, you automatically lock out most of the world from the magical system. And so it becomes elitist without you meaning it to be if you put it up free people can just work with it there's no rules there's no money barrier they can just get on and do it and then people started saying well i don't like working on reading from a screen and i don't have a printer can you do paperbacks and at first i was saying no because I had no idea how to do that. And I, I talked with Acher and stuff, and, you know, none of us really knew how to go about it. And then... I taught myself this rather archaic typesetting language on a whim years back, and it would do what we wanted it to do. It was very, very stable software. It was decades old. It was still being updated and maintained. It was free. We could do it. I already knew the language. It's called Latex. And off would come a PDF that was acceptable for printing. And so the books were born. And so people can, if they're uncomfortable with having something free, they can buy the books. If they don't want to work on screen, they can buy the books. If they don't have any money, it's free, it's online. They can do what the hell they like with it. It's just trying to find as many ways. There was also a big push once we had the idea to do the books to make sure that it was in physical form. It's been interesting now all the books are finished and this is something I didn't realise when I was putting the course together and it didn't dawn on me until about halfway through the course. The course itself is a magical structure and pattern that's taken on a life of its own. Within the work that we've done, it's formed this pattern and the books form that pattern. It becomes very talismanic. You have this structure all together with the books in the house it's opening up a whole new interesting area about how you work with magical books. And it's not that someone stood over it, did magic on the books or anything like that. It's itself. It's a living consciousness in itself or a window into the consciousness of the structure that was built through putting the course together and what's in the course. And the whole process of doing all of this with Michael is not only the technical side of it, working with someone who's not an adept magically, but who is in magic. As we were going back and forth with the conversations, it was very helpful to me because I'd put something in and it'd go, what? <laughs> you had your own pet idiot. I don't know. <laughs> well, the to thing try was... things out on. Exactly. It's like, here, try this. And if you're still alive next week, we know, we know it's okay. We know it's safe. Um, but it, it, it you know the, very... the idiot card in the, in the quarry of deck? <laughs> the face bears a surprising resemblance to, to me. <laughs> you're good and you know it, so shut up. <laughs> it was very interesting to have this back and forth with him because whenever you're doing something that you've done for a very long time, you forget about all the little nuts and bolts that hold it together. And so working with Michael really helped me in my approach to talking to students. So he was invaluable and it, it was like bringing him up to speed as well. Mm. 
um, because just through reading it, it was affecting him and change was happening around him. Things were waking up. It was very strange how stuff was, was getting kicked off by processing what she was writing. Yeah, it was very odd. It was good, though. It certainly moved me forward on the course. Reading her first book got me moving, and then this was just like a uh, pushing me onto the expressway <laughs> as I dodged cars. And It, uh, it was great, because he'd, he'd email and go, oh, my God, this is happening, and this, you know, in my life, and blah, 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 blah. And I'd go, what are you editing? Well, I'm editing this. Well, it's the same thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was bringing it out. There you go. Yeah. Manifest it. Right. Well, get on with it. Shut up. Stop whining. Go on. Get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. Many from the magical schools that we may already be familiar with from the past generally have some overarching religious or philosophical perspective. I'm just wondering if Korea also has something along those lines. And as a sort of follow-up question, do you have, uh, can you give us any insight into the basic intentions behind students who begin the course or maybe guiding people to, a, to basic intentions for beginning the course? The thing with the overarching religious or cultural structure or mindset, that was one of the things that Acher and I discussed a lot because the becomes too much of a closed-in boundary. It can work to segregate people off from different areas of magic. Mm -hmm. And you can get locked into... There are some schools that go to an extreme where you have to be of a certain nation and of a certain religion to even get through the door. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fine if, if that's what they're working with. That's, that's fine for them, but it locks a lot of people out. And it also narrows the field of the magic a lot. So it's like if you wanted to be a ballet dancer and you wanted to be able to dance a wide repertoire, then you don't train in a school that only works with one very tight system mm -hmm. because you don't you get narrower and narrower as you get more and more advanced. So this was one of the things of tearing everything apart. What I've done with the course is a series of different layers. So you have the approach of, well, there's all these different areas of magic that you need foundational understanding of and functional practice at. You also need to understand where these different religious, magical and cultural influences come from, why they're there and what they're doing, how they work, but not as a locked down belief system, but merely as a functional learning tool. So, like in the course, they will work with Egyptian stuff, they'll work with Greek stuff, they look at stuff in India, they look at stuff in Christianity, they look at stuff in Judaism, they look at all these different things because we're not like the 19th century. 19th century magic came out of white European Christian structure for the most part, not all of them, but, but most of them did. So straight away, you've locked a load of doors there. And it was also defined as high magic. There's just magic. It's what you do with it, it defines where it takes you. And, and also you as an individual, it defines where it takes you. What you do with these layers is you teach them these structures while also teaching them specific skills. So the skill matches up with the pattern. So they go into the pattern, they learn the skill, they learn the tools, and then they pull back out again. And sometimes further into the course, I put them in situations where they have to work with a deity or they have to work in a particular religious structure. And I haven't said why, just do it. Because they have to understand what's good about it and what's bad about it what's not useful and what is useful from their own direct experience. And everyone will take something different from that mm -hmm. according to who they are, where they're from, what they wish to achieve. There is no overarching. What is overarching is that it's magic. The overarching ethos of it is balance. Above everything else is balance and the work of divinity without it being a religious structure. Mm-hmm. But we're learning to work in a religious structure within that and understanding the difference between 
you know, the universe and the divinity of the universe and then understanding our religion, which is something completely different. And then understanding the magic that flows out of that pattern of that religion, which is something different again. So they're learning the mechanics of how all these different things work. And then by the time they come to the adept phase, they're starting to understand how they interconnect and how one builds on top of the other. And it's not about a defining mindset. It's about how you build something. You know, you don't get a Toyota car because you worship the name Toyota. You get it because they're pretty good at building engines and they're good, reliable cars. It's as simple as that. Mm. And it's, it's learning to pull away from the programming that we grew up with and we take with magic, we take it into magic. And people don't realize that they go into magic for all sorts of different reasons, but they take all their baggage with them. And part of the function of the course is to pick that apart so that people slowly begin to recognize that, which is the oldest foundation of magical training, know yourself. You really need to know who you are before you start stepping into very heavy magic and know what it is that you bring to the door. The overarching thing if, if I was to say there's one overarching thing with the course, it's being a fulcrum of the scales, of being that balance in the center that is neither good nor bad. It's neither white fluff or dark fluff. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's itself. It's magic. It's pure magic. But learning it through dipping into all of these different structures that interlock and interlink with each other. And that not only teaches you technique, it teaches you about yourself, which in turn gives you power. And a lot of people go into magic looking for power and control and don't realize that. It. It's like the whole thing when something goes wrong in a country that everybody's doing magic. Why? Because they don't feel they can do anything else. They have no control. And doing it that way doesn't give you control and it doesn't give you magic. It just gives you a playpen. Josephine, you said something earlier, and uh, I would like to use that and put that question to both of you, but from maybe two very different perspectives. You said you created that course because the other courses that are references are dated from the 19th century or early 20th, and there are things that were missing in our era. Now, you said certain things already which probably are part of the answer but what to you in particular was missing for our area that made it necessary to create a course like that and Michael then for you as somebody who is newer into the art what about you what did you feel that from your point of view was missing in the old courses Again, it, it depends in which language you function. In the English language, the magic information that's available is Golden Dawn, OTO. Mm. You know, it's all, all that same stable, basically. Mm. And particularly the Golden Dawn, it's very much within a religious structure. And it's very defined. It has very tight boundaries and it has very tight hierarchies, which was necessary at the time in the 19th century when it was being put together, it served its purpose. How we're different now, if you think, you know, the Victorian era in England in the late 19th century, everybody was Christian. Everybody felt that they lived in the country that ruled the world, the British Empire and all that. Everyone had a very specific type of education and a very specific worldview, and their worldview was coloured by the British Empire and also by the fact that people didn't travel very much in general. You got the very rich people did, but in you know the average guy in the street would have just gone to the seaside. If they were really lucky, they might have gone to the, the continent. They didn't understand much about other cultures. They were in the early phases of discovery in countries like Egypt and most of them had read the Greek classics in school and the Roman classics so that that was the worldview and things moved very slowly people thought very slowly people thought in very defined I don't want to say sexist and racist because that's a language of the 20th 21st century for them it wouldn't have been that way it was just that they were being how they were supposed to be you look at the world now 
we travel all over the place very quickly. We interconnect with each other all over the world very quickly. We we know far much more about different people's cultures. We know far more about ourselves. Our ability to tap into things has become much faster, much more refined. England lost its innocence. Well, Europe lost its innocence with the First World War. Mm. And then we had the Second World War. And then we've had war after war after war. We are not the same people that were building these type of courses. And one of the problems in the 20th century was that people were building new courses based upon the old course. So it was carrying all the same baggage from the old to the new. There was not this expanse of thinking of stepping outside the box and chaos magic opened that up. You know, Crowley started to open it up. Then chaos magic came along and really started to throw everything to the wind. Mm. And once it was thrown to the wind, when the bits all settled back down again, you realize that actually there's just magic and you need to learn the mechanics first, learn how the powers interact. And then later on, you start bringing in the cultural expressions, the different patterns and work with them. So, yeah, I mean, this course, for example, would not have worked for somebody in 1920. It wouldn't have worked for somebody in 1940. It's designed for people for the 21st century. For people, say, in America, who there's a lot of people in America still haven't traveled very much, if at all, have barely gone from state to state from a very Christian background, even if they've moved away from those roots. They don't have much understanding of the rest of the world, but they do have this connection through the internet, which has changed everything in magic. And so it's also about putting them into all these different situations to break that pattern up a little bit and loosen them up and loosen the thinking up. And for the chaos magicians, it's a bit more like, yes, you've got everything up there in, in the sky, right? Let's let's bring things down now in a way that coherently interlocks in a safe way. I mean, all the experiments that the chaos magicians did and continue to do loosen things right up, but it's chaotic by its just by its nature. Um, some things work together, some things don't work together. Some things connect, some things don't connect. And so it's the next phase on of, right, well, what does connect? What does plug together? What doesn't plug together? And why? Knowing why, how? This is the next stage now. It's not enough to know that this magical pattern does that. You need to know why it does that. How does it do that? What powers are coming? Where are they coming from? What filters them? What culture do they come out of? Why, why did they exist in the first place? So you start on a discovery of unraveling the weave and reweaving it in a different way. I think that's a pretty comprehensive answer, really. I, I think um, looking at it from the perspective of a student, I got started with Crowley stuff and Golden Dawn stuff, did about three years of it. And bits, I thought, worked pretty well. Like, for instance, Crowley's essay on meditation I think is really fantastic. The, the problem I had was that I couldn't get further that really than the beginning because the materials that were published from that time sort of had the expectation that you'd be taken under the wing of the lodges that were functioning at that time. From what I understand, I might not be quite accurate about that. But um, the result was that I, I kind of couldn't get very far with it. And neither could I really join a, a lodge because I travel really uh, as part of my living. So I couldn't guarantee I'd be in any place at any one time. So I needed something that worked as a solitary practitioner that could take me as far as I was able to go. The Quarrier course is designed to be worked by solitary practitioners and will indeed take you as far as you're able to go. You just start at lesson one and just <laughs> work your way forward as <laughs> and uh, it takes as long as it takes. Mm. So it's designed to work for someone that isn't in a lodge that doesn't have access to people that can answer questions or check that they're, they're getting the right end of the stick. So its materials are much less restrictively explained than, say, some of the Golden Dawn stuff or or some of Crowley's stuff, because the ex there, there isn't the expectation that you get to this stage and then an adept will come in and uh, take you the rest of the way. You have to do it all yourself. And I think that works for me. Quarrier can take the place of those systems that rely on a, um, a community of, of magic workers. 
that's the only thing I'd really add. It, yeah. it works very well if you're solitary. <laughs> If I may add my personal feeling about that, uh, I'm also somebody who travels a lot and who has a profession where he can't carry five ropes and seven staffs with you. <laughs> and uh, also in that respect, for the occultist, for the magician who likes to work in a steady way but is on the road or is does not have a five a room flat where he can expand himself yeah this is very much 21st century 21st century's life and korea mm. very much takes that into account in my opinion i think the other thing is and this was very intentional with putting the course together is that not only is it good for solitary that's how magic should be learned The idea that you join a school where there's a group of adepts and you all have your seven staffs and your robes and your hats and your wellies and all that sort of thing. And that you have this hierarchy and group politics and all the crap that comes with that. That's not how magic was meant to be. And that's not really how magic develops in a person to its greatest extent. It is an individual thing. And you have to find a midway between the extreme of being completely on your own and clueless and being prey to these to what can be predatory schools. I mean, that's the smaller percentage of them are predatory, but it is an issue. What's the bigger issue is group politics which is what people hit every single time. The midway in magic, in learning magic, is that it's all around you. You have to wake up to it and you learn vocabularies, you learn techniques, you learn skills, practical skills that only you can learn on your own. You can't learn it in a classroom, in a magical classroom. You have to do it. You have to experiment with it. And by doing that, you grow your own strength. You become strong. You begin to understand through direct experience, which you then build. So you evolve as a person. And the idea with Quarrier is that you have all the vocabulary that you need, but no more. You have all the pointers and structures that you need and no more. So there's beyond Quarrier, there's a 90%, Quarrier is 10% of magic. Even though it's so vast, in, in actual fact, it's only 10% of magic. The rest of it you have to discover for yourself in your own unique way. And by doing that, it's not product. You know, people want to do a course, turn around, be a teacher. They have a product, they make money. That's not magic. It's a lifelong thing. You get the basics. Once you get to adept, really, that's the beginning. And then you become magic, you live magic, you work magic. And it's so unique to you, it can't possibly pass on to anyone else. All you can do is pass on the vocabulary, the structures, the patterns, and what they will make of it will be something completely different. That's how it evolves. That's how magic evolves. And the whole idea of the lodge school really only goes back to the 19th century. When you keep going back and back and back, what you have is... The teacher, you know, someone would have an, a, a teacher who would give them 1% and then tell them to go away and get the rest of the 99% for themselves and then come back. If you're still alive, come back and I'll give you the next 1% and see what you make of that. And if you're still alive after that, come back and I'll give you a bit more. Mm. And and so it's trying to change how people think about education in a magical sense because people have become used to this commercial setting where they pay a lot of money and they're given very glossy books and they go to meetings and they're given a very glossy robe and then they pay some more money and then they get another glossy robe and they go up a step and they get in a pedestal and they start to then define how the training happens because they're customers they're consumers and you then get the trap of the student starts dictating to the teacher, well, I paid for this, I want better than this, which is one problem. The other problem, you flip that around, is where the teacher thinks, well, this student's not really, magic is not a good fit, but I need the money. Mm. And it's a very easy, slippery road to get onto. So you end up fixing and maneuvering the magic to fit the commercial model and it's not done with bad intent but it's an easy slippy road to get into and so you have students that shouldn't be there but they're there because it's a, it's a commercial contract and with the best will in the world if you have that pattern going 
it's going to trip you up at some point. It's going to trip the student up at some point. It's going to put the student in a situation they shouldn't be in. And I've had horror stories of of people messaging me saying, well, I'm in this school and I paid so much, you know, I've got direct debit going, but I have a really bad feeling about where this is going. And they're really screaming at me because I cancelled the direct debit. They've told me they're going to curse me and I must never talk about what I've learned. Or this whole ridiculous situation. It's like, dudes, grow the fuck up, you know? None of that needs to be happening. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the different stages of development in the course and sort of the hallmarks that signify each one and how maybe a student might recognize that. And I'm curious to hear Michael's reaction, having gone through it, um, his impressions. It starts out with the apprentice action. The first part of the apprentice section is about teaching them to sit down and shut up, learning to meditate, learning to be silent, which is very important in this age because everyone is constantly plugged in to noise, to social media, to externalizations of the imagination. A lot of magic happens within the mind. The mind is one of the biggest tools in magic. But these days, it's, it's actually very difficult. If you take a phone off of someone, they freak out. People need to learn to sit down and be quiet. They need to learn to meditate. They need to then start to understand how their inner senses work. So they go through a series of exercises of learning how to work with the imagination in this realm and how to start to discipline the imagination to work so that it works for you as a tool rather than as a runaway horse. They learn the basics of divination. They learn the basics of ritual. And then from then, they start learning about patterns and how patterns work and what magical patterns are. It moves on a bit further. They start to learn about the world around them from an inner sense, the the beings, non-bodied beings, non-physical beings that are around you in the land. You learn about your landscape. They go through these different progressions of learning these basics. They learn about the basics of the tools. What are magical tools? How do they work? What do you do with them? And then from there, they're starting to develop working in vision, working magically in vision and learning then techniques of working in vision while working ritually. So they're bringing the two techniques together. Then they start to go through phases of learning about how to look at text Classical text, magical texts, ancient texts are not written in the way that you expect a textbook to be written today. In a textbook, it has bullet points and it has summaries and it's all very laid out for you. This is this A, B, C, D. In magic, that never happened until very recently. So when you're looking at very old magical texts, you need to understand the system that was used to produce them, to write them, so that you can actually read beyond the surface layer that in turn teaches you how to look at magic beyond the surface layer so you learn a reading technique that then applies as a magical technique you then can then use that as you're building a magical structure you can use the same technique again so it's applied in many different ways and that brings them up into the initiate section where they're learning how magical structures work how that interlocks with ritual, with vision, with sigils, with divination. All of these different things are brought together to learn how different structures operate, where they are. Where were they culturally 5,000 years ago? Why did they exist then? What were they doing then? What are they doing now? How do you tap into them? Is it relevant to tap into them? Well, I don't know. Find out for yourself. Go do it. See what happens. Keep a journal. So they go through all these different experiences. And it's what it also does is underneath, that's the surface layer of the course. Underneath that is this constant taking them from the first step through the temple door and then going through the long path of coming to know yourself. And that's not about, you know, well, am I egotistical or, you know, am I this, am I that? It's who are you? How do you as an individual being that's unique, how do you function when there's nobody else around you? How do you function at a magical, spiritual, mystical level? What are you? Who are you? And this goes into much, much deeper layers again of then if you know who you are, you know what it is you're working with. 
and it, it goes around in a circle. It goes around in a spiral. You go round and round, looking ever deeper, ever deeper. What is it that you live in? This universe, what are you living in? What are you talking to? How does it exist? Why does it exist? How do you interact with it magically? How do you bring that magically through you to then work outwards? And all of that is done in a layer that goes underneath that, again, of service. You don't concentrate on yourself. This is what makes it very different as well from other magical systems. Other magical systems are about self-evolution. So is Quaria, but by you don't do it in Quaria by examining yourself. You do it by examining everything else around you and serving everything else around you. Be useful. And by doing that, you start to look at the world through different eyes because you have to look at the other person or the other being or the other land that you're serving, that you're working on. It's not a one-track service. It's wherever it's necessary. Necessity is the word for this course. It's what's necessary. And you learn through dealing with other, other necessity what your own necessity is. And then there's another layer underneath that, again, which works with the very ancient pattern of going down into the underworld, going through transformation of the underworld, being torn apart which is the apprentice section, the part of being put together, the Osiris action of everything coming back together, which is the initiate section, and then the rising into the stars, which is the adept section. So you're doing this very, very ancient pattern of going down through the underworld, reassembly, up through the stars, and you bring all of that back down to the earth and then work through. That's the Arubos. You work through that then. You become that Arubos. You become that constant circling of power that affects and interacts with everything around it. So uh, as far as editing it was concerned, and, and as a sort of first person to um, read it and process it, I'd say that the apprentice section, it felt like what you think magic probably is. Then you're gradually moving from being given various sort of toys to play with to having to figure out what toys you're going to play with to tackle these challenges in the initiate section. And then it goes a, a whole nother level of meta that I can't think up good sounding words to talk about, which is kind of ironic given I'm the bloody copy editor. But um, I refer you to my learned friend who went before. Uh, to, by the time you get to the adept section, you very much having to figure stuff out by yourselves. You're being given the ingredients for a ritual and you're told, okay, you've got to, you got to come up with that ritual yourself. You probably remember you went to visit such and such in the underworld. Go back there, but I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do it. You can figure it out yourself. So by the time you get to the adept stage, you are very much working proactively to fulfill what your objective is. Whereas in the apprentice stage, you are being not really spoon fed, but you're being given all of the steps that you, quite explicitly. So you have all the tools you need by the time you get to the adept stage. Yeah, actually, if you were to take a programming metaphor, the apprentice section, you're, you're sort of building your simple functions. The uh, initiate stage, you're combining those together in more interesting ways. And then in the adept stage, you're tackling quite large projects based on the tools that you've built up in the previous two stages. <laughs> yeah, I didn't beat it, did I, Josephine? <laughs> <laughs> And the thing is that through what I, I sort of eased them in fairly gently. So a lot of the stuff in the apprentice section, if people have sort of stuck their heads in various different magical cupboards, they'll recognize the, the skeletons and mechanics of the basic vocabulary of magic. But then it starts bringing in more shamanic type work. It brings in more mystical type work because... You know, even if you don't want to be a shamanic adept or a, or, or a mystical adept, or you need all, you need to know what they are properly. You need to really properly be able to know what they are and be able to do it if you need to. And the only way to do that is to learn them, and not learn them by reading a book, but by learning them by going and doing it. My job is to teach them how to go do it. Their job is to go and actually do it. And then watch what happens, work with those sequences of what happens so that then, they're, OK, well, I never want to work with rivers, but now I know how to. So if that ever happens, that I need to. I have that skill. I can do that. 
And this is about taking away this very formal structure of, well, actually, we only do rituals in a temple and we only do them in grades and colors and, you know, blah, 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 blah. You have to be magic. You're an adept. You need to be able to deal with anything that needs dealing with. You can't say, well, you know, there's this huge being is coming at me, then it's really destructive. And I put up my magical sword and it knocked it out of my hand. What do I do next? You know, that's basic level. That shouldn't be an issue for an adept. You see a being, you need to know how to deal with it. You want to work on the land, you need to know how to do that and do it properly. You need to be able to go, say your job sent you to go work in India and you happen to be very psychic and there's sort of local beings and deities crashing in on you. You need to be able to know how to deal with that, not by banishing and and threatening this, that and the other, but how to hold a conversation, how to find out why are they doing that? What, What do they need from you? What do they want? Open a conversation. Is there a job that needs doing? Well, yeah, I can do that for you. And it's getting people out of this mentality of, well, if I do a job, what are you going to do back for me? That's a killer in magic. It really is a killer. That would shut so much stuff down. You work by necessity. A being or a person or an animal or the land has need. You fulfill that need. If you're in the right place at the right time, you're put in front of the job, you do the job. You go back on your merry way and you're, you're walking your path through life. You suddenly have need. This is how it works. If you're working within a magical pattern that's based on the fulcrum of balance and necessity, when you have necessity, it will step up, it will be there. And that's not a theory. That's something I've lived with all of my life. I'm in my mid-50s and it's never failed me. And it's never failed anyone that I've trained is you you learn to become part of a huge functioning machine, which is the universe. And you all work in it together and everyone has a little job and it moves around a lot, but you all you all have purpose, you all have function and you learn how to operate within that without the whimsy, without the Disney channel, without the love and light or the dark or anything like you just do a fucking job. You know, you just do magic. That's what you do. You're a magician. You go through life and you do magic when it's necessary. To get to that, you need to have the mechanics within you. You need to understand them. You need to be very clear about what things are, how they work, why they work, and who you are, why why you are, and why you work. You get very flexible by having a very systematic understanding of how all the bits go together, I guess. Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you do. It's like, for example, back to ballet. The teacher that trained me came out the Kiro. All of that, her line, her teacher was a, a Kiro student. Uh, it's a very specific, very classical line, but it's very pure classicism. And it's very, what they call it, it's all adage work. It's very powerful work. It doesn't do petty allegro like the danish school does it's it's not very good at that it doesn't have the plasticity of american ballet new york city ballet has its own start balancing it's very free it's very expressive modern choreographers that are coming out of germany out of denmark out of america they have this amazing plasticity and imagination a kirov dancer who's never done anything other than kirov work is dead in the water with with that type of choreography they don't have the plasticity for it, so they have to start relearning. That's why a lot of Kirov dancers, as soon as the wall came down, a lot of them moved west because they needed a wider repertoire to expand their technique and their knowledge. It's the same in magic. You need to have the plasticity to be able to flow. So you go, say you get moved to Africa in, in a job for three, three years. You know, Can you function magically? And start to talk. Do you have a common vocabulary that you can talk to the local community, the local folk magicians there? Can you get straight into a conversation with them, understand what they're talking about and work with them without co-opting their stuff, them co-opting from you and having to become a Western magician or you pretending to become an African magician? You're neither. You're each other. You're yourselves. But there's a common vocabulary. And it's all about training magicians to have that world plasticity and common vocabulary so that you can, wherever you are, whoever you're around, 
you are magic. You can be magic. And it takes a lot of work to get to that. A lot of training. A training that for some people it's five years, for some people it's 20 years. It doesn't matter. It gets you where you need to go when you need to get there. And that way you don't get any blowbacks as well. If you hit Africa running as a Golden Dawn magician, you're going to hit a wall so fucking hard you won't know what's hit you. You know, there's some real power in that continent that comes straight out of the land. You need to be flexible enough to be able to converse and communicate and to respect and to be equal with rather than be trapped in a structure that's suffocating you magically. Thank you so much. It's yeah. really well, been a pleasure. Thank you for asking us. It's really kind of you to have yeah. us on. Um, yeah, thank you so much. It's, yeah. been, it's been great. And this is a great, great thing you're doing here. I really appreciate it. I continue to support it and suggest it. So um, oh, thank you. I'm glad it's growing and doing well. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We've got people great, from... Yeah, thank from you. Every continent in the world we've now, except from Antarctica, we don't have It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter That's of time. That's right. <laughs> One of those scientists will eventually come on board, right? Yeah. yeah. Got, it's amazing. There's people from everywhere around the world and all different professions. Scientists, we've got doctors, artists, thinkers, you know, bus drivers. It's amazing. It's great. All these different types of people from all these different cultures and countries. The only thing they need is to be able to read English. It makes you wonder how many people doing all this that we just never heard from because exactly. recently we've been able to link up, you know, yeah. Yeah. As, a, as a culture with the internet. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Thank all you right. both so much. I hope you have a Thank good you. rest of your evening. You too. Thank you. you too. Take all care, right. all of you. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 If you haven't already taken a look, the Occult of Personality membership section has been redesigned and resurrected as the Chamber of Reflection at chamberofreflection.com. There, Josephine, Michael, Rudolph, and I continue the interview discussing some rather interesting occurrences and lessons learned during the creation of the Korea course. Join us for that fascinating conversation. And I'd also like to mention that on Saturday, July 29th, Ezekiel Bates Lodge and Lumen Scienti will host a day of talks on the subject of alchemy and transformation in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Presenters include renowned alchemist Brian Cottonoir discussing the famed Emerald Tablet, Eastern medicine practitioner and author Craig Williams speaking about the use of plant medicines and bodily health for self-realization, host of the Glitch Bottle podcast Alexander F. talking about the magical grimoire tradition as an avenue for self-transformation, and yours truly presenting material from David Chaim Smith's upcoming book, Deep Principles of Kabbalistic Alchemy. This is a singularly amazing opportunity to hear about many aspects of alchemy and magic in a single day. There will not be another event like this anytime soon, so I encourage you to attend. Tickets are $15 per person and available now at eb1870.org slash alchemy dash transformation I'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge the costs to produce it are significant your financial contributions ensure the continuity of the free podcast please support a cult of personality podcast by joining the membership section at chamberofreflection.com or via Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. And if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks, and I salute you. Thanks again for listening, and until next time.